Did anyone ever tell you that there are 12 historical facts that verify Jesus literally rose from the dead? And did you know that these 12 historical facts are accepted as true by over 90% of the most influential New Testament historical scholars in the world today? Well, it's true. So my question to you is, would you be interested in hearing what these 12 historical facts are? My guest today is Dr. Gary Habermas, one of the world's most respected and well-known scholars on the historical evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Professor Habermas holds a Doctor of Philosophy degree from Michigan State University in History and Philosophy of Religion. And he is the chairman of the Department of Philosophy at Liberty University in Lynchburg, Virginia. He's also the author, co-author, or editor of over 40 books. So we invite you to join us for the special edition of The John Ankerberg Show to hear these 12 historical facts that show Jesus literally rose from the dead. Welcome to our program. I'm John Ankerberg, and my honored guest is the prestigious Gary Habermas. He's a professor of philosophy and uh, one of the world's best-known scholars and researchers on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And Gary is talking to people that are skeptics about religion, about Jesus, about the Bible. Say, I don't want to have anything to do with that. Would it make a difference to you if we presented to you 12 historical facts about Jesus' resurrection that are accepted by almost 95% of the greatest scholars around the world? That's why I want you to listen today, because we're going to talk about 12 historical facts. And Gary, start me off here. When you went to Michigan State, you were actually thinking of becoming a Buddhist, okay? And you were you were thinking about your Ph.D. uh, paper, what you were going to write on, okay, and your topic. And you got your committee together and tell us what in the world you chose and why. Well, you you know, I often get asked. so tell me, you must be doing this because you want to talk to people who are doubters and you want to help them. And I'll say, no. <laughs> I wasn't that altruistic. I wanted to help me. <laughs> I had questions, and I didn't see grounds for believing them. So it was like a serious thing to me. It was like uh, every day. I mean, I played a lot of sports, and I would play till, the, you know, till nighttime, and then I would come inside. And it wasn't like, what homework do I have to do? It's where did I leave off on my doubts? That yeah. was my first question every night for years. So what was your topic that you chose, and what, how did the committee respond? Well, I suggested a topic on the resurrection, and actually they went for it pretty quickly. Now, today, when I'm on dissertation committees, we have three people. I had six on my committee, and they were split between those who believed in the resurrection and those who didn't. And I uh, had an agnostic historian on my committee. He was the most complimentary person in my dissertation. But they accepted it. But as we were ending the meeting, the head of the meeting, who was also one of the skeptics, he said, you can do the resurrection. But he said, we don't want any of this stuff. Uh, these things happen because the New Testament says so. And now I had read so much critical literature by that time, I was pretty sure what he meant, but I wanted to be sure. And, and so I found out what, what he was me- meaning was, use the New Testament as much as you want, but don't use a text that's not well evidenced. So I mean, I often use the illustration, maybe it's like the spider that knows which strands to run in so as not to get caught. He would just say, know what strands to run in. Because if you read a Bart Ehrman or almost anybody, any critic, they're going to outquote conservative Christians for verses, but they know what strands to run on. Yeah, Bart Ehrman today is one of the leading atheists, and he's a New Testament critic, and uh, probably one of the most well-known critics in the United States, all right, right. maybe around the world. Right. And the fact is, uh, he'll say, you can use Paul's books, uh, what, seven of the books? Seven of the 13. Okay, and uh, tell us why he chose and. Listen, Paul is the darling of the skeptics today, okay? What does that mean? Does it mean that they believe the Bible is the inspired Word of God? What does it mean? Well, uh, one critical scholar, Luke Timothy Johnson, he will use all 15 of Paul's epistles. But by and large, uh, critical scholars say, basically, I'll give you seven, seven of the 13. That doesn't mean all the rest of them are losers or something. It just means that 
we're going to be sure of these. And if you use Paul's seven epistles, which are, I mean, I often say it this way, if your pastor is going to preach on Paul, these are the seven books he'll most likely use. They're the major books, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Philippians, 1st Thessalonians, and Philemon is sort of the tag on at the end because it's a one-chapter non-theological book. So those first six in particular are highly theological, and critics just let you cite them. Now, if you say, well, you don't think Paul's inspired? No. Well, why are you just letting people cite him? Well, think about it. He basically is equivalent of, I always say, it's like Paul had a PhD in Old Testament. Yeah, from Gamaliel. Under Gamaliel, according to the book of Acts, he was a scholar, scholar, uh, but also he had some, I don't know, enough athleticism, he could run out and grab people who are protesting because they arrested men, men, women, children. And uh, he oversaw that. He had a lot of zeal. He thought he was doing God a favor by doing these things. I think this is the key. He would not, they wouldn't say he could never be wrong, but he would never purposely be wrong. He would never lie. He believes he's speaking the truth. And last of all, he knew after his conversion, he knew the apostles. He knew the apostolic leaders. Yeah. And that's the key. He knows what they were teaching in a very early day. Yeah, and before he got, uh, he saw the risen Jesus on the road to Damascus, the fact is he was out there hunting the Christians, and he was actually uh, trying to kill them in some cases. Right. So the fact is the, the skeptical scholars say, you know, this guy Paul, scholar, and uh, against the Christians after, the, after Jesus was crucified, uh, you know, and he's a logical writer. He gave us the book of Romans, which is a great treatise. And so the fact is, we like him. He's a scholar, okay? All right, so now you had a bunch of facts that you could have chosen. And you chose as the first one as a fact that no scholar should disagree with, including all the ones on your committee, to get this Ph.D. dissertation done, is you chose what? What was number one? Well, the strange thing is we talk in historical Jesus, and Habermas starts with crucifixion. Whoa, what about his life? No, we got to talk about crucifixion. So, see, because in the Gospels, in the New Testament, whenever the Gospel is defined, it always refers to a claim that Jesus' deity died on the cross, rose from the dead. So to me, you have to talk about Jesus' teachings, and that makes you back up a little bit. But for these facts, I always start with the crucifixion. And you take a scholar like Bart Ehrman, he is going to allow from his books 15 independent evidences, uh, reports for the crucifixion, a number of them not in the canonical New Testament. Yeah, so. yeah. and let's, uh, let's go back because we've been doing this, uh, actually you and I, we've been taping for 40 years, yeah. if people can believe that. Right. Okay, and when we started this, we had a whole group of, of critical scholars that said, Jesus, ah, he didn't really die. Okay, some guy said that uh, he just swooned on the cross, came down, they put him in the tomb, and the fact is he revived and came out. Or the soldiers uh, somehow let him get by, and he went, and, you know, and uh, revived. And, and Josephus actually had, what, two, three friends, and uh, they were crucified, and uh, all of a sudden he says, hey, those are my friends, get them down. And uh, they got the three guys down, and two of them uh, still died because they got medical care. One guy survived. So out of that kind of background, people said, ah, you know, I'm not sure that Jesus died on the cross. It had to be something else. And so you had, number one, we had to prove that Jesus died. How in the world did you prove that Jesus actually died? Well, first of all, I went after both medically and historically. Now, uh, most critical scholars, no matter how critical, let's say the Bart Ehrman that we've already introduced, uh, he wouldn't even think of questioning whether Jesus died on the cross. Why? One reason, one reason is because of what happens medically yep. to people on the cross. And there are built-in checks and balances to make sure that a person on the cross is dead. And we have Roman sources. And, and, and you know, last time we did this, we had a crucifixion victim. Now there are two. There have been another discovered crucifixion victim whose bones are there. So I can tell about the, the, the nails, and almost every reference says nails, not tied. We've learned a so, lot about how the Romans did crucifixion. Right. Talk about the process quickly. Well, there was no one process. Like, they didn't have to use a, a tau shape or, or a, like a, what we call a cross. Uh, it could have been a stake. 
that Josephus said that when the Romans uh, took Jerusalem, plundered Jerusalem about 40 years after Jesus died, he said they ran out of wood. He said they used every piece of wood and stuck these guys up there in every conceivable way. And Josephus is not the only one who says that. There, the few references that describe crucifixion, they, they're grotesque. And generally the person was whipped first. And comments about beatings are nasty, with or without crucifixion. Um, one writer says they would often whip people until their organs came out. Right. So, I mean, it's nasty, nasty. And then you'd nail them up there. Yeah. And um, it's probably mostly over by that time. Yeah. So then how did the Romans, who weren't medical students, how did they know a guy was dead when he was on the cross? Yeah, and that's a great question. Like, like uh, if I role play and I play a skeptic, I'm going to say, yeah, well, how do you guys know he's dead? Did you, did you uh, remember to plug in the EEG and the EKG before you did this? Would you plug him into a rock? And where's the guy with the MD from Johns Hopkins, you know? Um, and, and, you know, it, it, the question goes like this. The Roman soldier may not be an MD, but he's been in battle, and he's alive because he's good at this. And the point is not where are the organs. The point is where do you drop a man the fastest? And they knew the center of the chest would be the place you can get him in a shoulder, you get him a leg, you can hobble him, but you want to kill him quickly, you go for the center of the chest. And with spears and things, you know, not so much for the head, they've got helmets on, center of the chest. So the Romans knew that. The question isn't could they pass an anatomy exam, it's how best to kill them. And they yeah. were very good at that. Well, we have two things going on. One is the long way of crucifying a guy was asphyxiation. What does that mean? And then they took the short route because of the holiday there. Tell me what that means. Yeah, uh, if you do a survey, which I just finished doing for this large magnum opus I'm doing on the, on the uh, death and resurrection of Jesus, uh, there are different suggestions from medical doctors for exactly how someone dies on the cross. Most people think shock is involved. Most pe people think congestive heart failure. But the, by far the most popular option is that death by crucifixion is essentially death by asphyxiation. And if a person hangs in a down position, the muscles, the intercostal pectoral deltoid muscles that you work out in a the gym, they're the ones that they get pulled down by the weight of the body and the person can't breathe very long. And you go, well, wait a minute. He was on the cross for just a few hours, and everybody thought it wasn't long enough. Well, because they could push up on a little, most likely, either push up on a little piece of wood or on the nails that are through the feet, which is pretty grotesque. But when you can't do that anymore and you lose your strength, and, and like I tell people, if, if your staying alive depends on you doing pull-ups, uh, people aren't going to be doing very many. And so it's, a, it's a, attrition. And when, he gets, when the person gets tired, they're low on the cross. And here's a key point. If you hang low and you're not pushing up and you're not shouting, because if you shout, you talk, you're in the up position. You have to, you have to exhale. And if you're down low, in some experiments, as soon as 11 or 12 minutes, the person's unconscious. So if you're in the low position, 15, 20, 30 minutes, don't mess with him, he's dead. When John says that they come to the two men and they saw Jesus was already dead, you go, where's your medical degree? I got eyes. I could see he's hanging at the bottom of the cross. So it's a, it's a built-in check, check and uh, minus system where you can tell what's going on. But they still did something else, too, to double check. <laughs> yes, and you know what? The spear wound is mentioned only in John. So people say, well, yeah, John, you know, the most doubted of the four Gospels. But you know what? We have several other sources, secular, non-Christian, outside the Gospels, for piercing bodies. It's sort of like the centurion says, he's not getting down on my watch. You know, you know, this is between me and him. If I have to report to Pilate or whomever, it's not going to be because I wasn't watching. Yeah. This guy's going to be dead. So what did he do? They stabbed him in, in, the, in, the, in the side. And the, by far the leading medical view, it's, it talks about blood and water. And the, the thinking is one of two things, is that in a horrible beating, the, you can get pleural effusion, which involves the lungs. And the lung cavity fills with the bloody water, and it, it collapses and you can't, you can't, that's one way you don't breathe. The other thing is that around the heart there's a sac, it's called the pericardial sac, and it, there's actually two real thin ones, but 
it holds a liquid. And there's not a whole lot of cc's there, but there's a little bit of liquid. And so the thought is, again, these folks are soldiers. They know where to stab. Either the water came from the pleural cavity from the lungs that were about ready, probably, are, you know, he was already dead according to the report, so they already given out. And if you're going to pierce that wafer-thin pericardium, it would be virtually impossible to pierce the pericardium and not pierce the heart. It's like if you, if you stick a sword through two sheets of paper, uh, is it going to go through all the way or is it going to stop? Well, what's going to stop it? It's soft tissue. So the spear, well, as the Journal of the American Medical Association article said about 30 years ago that was published, they said he was dead when the spear entered his chest. If he wasn't, the spear certainly would have done the job. Yeah, and the scholars that used to say that uh, something happened like that, he got off the cross, now even guys like John Dominic Crossan, Bart Ehrman, what do they say now? None of the guys of that stature question this. In fact, John Dominic Crossan and his, I don't want to say sidekick, but two of the major founders of the Jesus Seminar, the late Marcus Borg, John Dominic Crossan, they both said very similar words The fact that Jesus died by crucifixion is as sure as any fact in the ancient world. Yeah, and what did Bart Ehrman say? Bart Ehrman says we have 15 authentic sources, and it's one of his two major facts that we can know about Jesus that he died by crucifixion. Okay, so that was number one. Number two was the fact is that uh, he was buried, okay? Now, this is in a way uh, controversial, but in some sense, the fact is, obviously, anybody that dies is buried. So tell me the story here. Right, and notice, whenever I list 12 facts, I just say he was buried, because I don't want to get into a discussion. If they go, no, they, uh, the most common kind is a hole in the ground, and they put you there. Uh, even the weird suggestion that they threw him in the dump in the middle of the city. And the dogs uh, ate him. Things mm-hmm. like that, and the dogs. But the point is about him being buried, All these scenarios require his death. If he's underground, if the dogs are eating him and he's burning to death, if he is in a a tomb and uh, it's closed up and they've taken him in there, and, you know, whatever you think about the Shroud of Turin, I mean, there's the man buried in the Shroud is in a state of rigor mortis. I mean, so when they put him in there, he's a a goner. But in Jerusalem, they've got these uh, limestone tombs that are very common. And the story is that Joseph, a, a member of the Sanhedrin, uh, buried him in his own tomb. And, you know, one good argument for that is that four out of four sources, we think, sometimes we think of these four authors as sitting together around a table. John, what do you have for this? Mark, hey. Okay, well, I'm going to go with these words. They're not. They're, they're spread around the Mediterranean. And the fact that they're telling the same story, now someone's going to say, time out. Uh, Matthew and, and Luke most likely used Mark for one of the sources that Luke said he used. Well, John's an independent source. That makes it independent. Most scholars, according to a recent survey, most scholars believe that Mark used what's called a pre-Mark and Passion narrative. Mark had another source for the crucifixion. And because the way it's written, they think it was composed before 37 A.D. Yeah. So if Mark is really early at plus 40, how about seven? Is a seven-year-old source good? But the point is, they go by independent sources. Mark is one. John is one. Mark's source makes three. There's a creed in Acts chapter 13, a Pauline creed that talks about Jesus being buried. That's four minimal sources. Scholars aren't even sure if Matthew and Luke even used Mark at this point. We've got more sources than we need for the burial. Yeah. And so you got two. He, Jesus died by crucifixion, and he was buried. And this caused his disciples what? Well, any is, normal psychological reaction is that these men and women would feel totally crushed. It's like, I left my fishing business. I left my tax. You know, I had a pretty good living, and I was with my wife and children. I left it all. I thought he would redeem Israel, as the two men say on the way to Emmaus. We thought he was going to, the Romans, they're, they're still acting up and this guy did nothing. It was a waste. I wasted three years of my life. Uh, you can't think those things and not be depressed in some sense. So often that Saturday is often called Black Saturday. It's Depression Saturday for these people. Yeah, and almost all the accounts that we do have in the four Gospels and even other accounts that we have from the Church Fathers talk about how depressed they were, okay? And uh, 
everything was gone for them, which sets up this next one is the fact is that something happened and all of the scholars across the world will admit that something happened after the third day. What was it? I'd say the three major facts in Jesus' life that's going to have nearly unanimous consent is that he preached the kingdom of God, he died for it, even Rudolf Bultmann said that, he died for it, and the disciples believed that they saw him again. So kingdom, so he's a king, if he's got a kingdom, you're going down, they kill him, and the disciples were so convinced, from that point on it was like they were shot out of a cannon. Something had to shoot them out of a cannon, and they were convinced they'd seen appearances of the risen Jesus. All right, we're only at uh, four historical facts, and that's on purpose, because we got 12, and then we got some conclusions, plus we can quote a whole ton of scholars here, all right? But I want you to get the idea that the, the four facts that we've talked about so far are historical facts, okay? Even if you didn't have the Bible, the fact is you could prove these from ancient sources, and we have done that, in fact, Gary, in your dissertation, that's exactly what you did. The reason you passed was because you didn't hang it on Bible verses. You hanged it on all kinds of sources that you put into your book, and that's what we're going to continue to do as we go along. Tell us, uh, tell us the punchline of where we're going without giving the whole story away. Well, working through the whole 12, and, and the prerequisite for these is that they're not only evidence, that all 12 have to be evidenced. Pick any fact you want, and they're evidenced like this. All the other data are going to come in and say it's true. And secondly, as a bonus, like I seen on the cake, the critics agree with these facts. So you have that kind of basis, and then you say, okay, well, if I have that kind of foundation, I want to know what the best conclusion that we can, uh, what's the best conclusion we can come to for all this data? Yeah. Now, I want to come back when we start our program next week, and I want to start with this one again and, and give a, a little bit of review for the people. But I want to zero in more on the evidence for the fact that the disciples had experience which they believed were literal appearances of the risen Jesus to them. They said, we saw him, we touched him, we talked with him, and it's not just a few of them, okay? It's 500 in one case. It's 12 apostles in another case. It's women in another case. We're going to talk about where we get this evidence, why it's early, why scholars right across the board, because this other book, you're quoting 4,000 sources, and you got, what, 2,200 scholars that you've been checking since 1975. They agree with you. How many percentage-wise of the scholars that are not Christians necessarily, but they're New Testament critics of the New Testament in some of the highest places academically in the world. How many of them agree with these 12 historical facts? I would say they're going to be in the... Now, the, you, you alluded to the fact that there's a few dropouts on right. where he was buried, but that he was buried and these other facts, I would place the numbers in the 90s for sure. 90%. Okay. Oh, oh, well over 90%. Okay, but I, I'm just simply saying that's the kind of research that we're doing, and I want you to join us because this concerns you. When you look at these historical facts, what are the conclusions that you make about Jesus? That's why we're doing this program. I'm so glad you joined us this week. Stay tuned. I've got a personal word for you in just a moment. <music> 